Cell 411 is a great free app for Android and iPhone. It allows you to set up public and private cells for dealing with crime, emergencies, setting up neighborhood watch, activism, and even protecting your kids from bullies on the street or at school. Cell 411 gives your cells turn-by-turn -turn directions to your location with one touch on your phone. There is also a Bluetooth panic button available that can be worn on your wrist, belt, or around your neck. Cell 411 has real-time chat for each alert so you can discuss the incident with family or friends in real-time video streaming. The video is stored on Cell 411's servers so your evidence cannot be deleted if your phone is taken or destroyed. Cell 411 has decentralized ride-sharing that allows for payment in any form – crypto, barter, silver, cash, etc. Cell 411 does not take a cut of your fare. Get Cell 411 free on Google Play and the iTunes Store or go to GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com. Hey, everybody, it's Jeremy, and I just have a couple of things to say before we start this week's show. First of all, the audio on this is a little bit off. This was recorded on Skype, but when the opportunity presented itself to have a conversation with Daniele Bellelli, I jumped on it, and because he was so gracious as to make time for me the very next day after we first connected, I wasn't going to try to make him jump through hoops and, you know, download feed phone or work out the Discord thing with me. So Skype was the quickest way to do it. So we did that. I did clean it up a bit, but there are a few points where there was some extra background noise as Daniele was talking that I felt if I messed with it any further, it would actually make it worse. So I left those as is. But the conversation was a really great one, and it was a real pleasure and honor for me to get a chance to speak to him. So I hope you guys enjoy it. And I also want to give a special thanks to my friend and former co-host, Danilo Cuellar, who actually is the one who set up the conversation between Daniele and I and gave me the opportunity to speak with him. So thank you for your service, Danilo. I appreciate it, buddy. <laughs> and once again, I uh, hope you guys enjoy the show. Peace. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Abolitionist Abstractions. As always, we are covered by a Bipicot No Government License. This allows reuse by anyone except governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information about this at bipcot.org. So I am back, and this week I have a very special guest, uh, somebody who uh, I'm a, a big fan of his work. He, uh, among other things, he is the host of the History on Fire podcast, and one that I've, I, th I think, I've talked about on the show a couple of times, especially the most, uh, the most recent ones that came out. Uh, Mr. Daniele Bellelli, uh, thank you very much for joining me tonight, sir. How are you doing? Good. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's uh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, as as I said, I, I think I talked about your most recent, uh, well, the it's a series of podcasts that are coming out. Uh, the one with uh, that. Uh, compare the Sand Creek Massacre to the My Lai Massacre in Vietnam. Yeah, and those are, it's not exactly, you know, that's heavy, heavy listening, to say the least, because those are really dark. I mean, you know, most history gets heavy. Those topics get extra heavy. It's got really, really dark. Yes, uh, yeah, they they definitely did. And you, you uh, prepped everybody very nicely in the beginning of that podcast and let everybody know. Oh, what, what was kind of coming. Uh, and yep. uh, I had actually mentioned, because my, my, fr my friend uh, and former co-host, Daniel Cuellar, is uh, the one who put the two of us in touch together. And I was actually talking to him about it because uh, I know he listens to the podcast as well. And I had said that I, I, I was, was kind of prepared for the one that you did, the first one, the one on the Sand Creek <laughs> Massacre, because that's actually a very, like, I've studied 
that part of history rather extensively, which is actually kind of what led me down my path uh, th- through the years from turning from uh, kind of you know, one of those useful idiot people who just like went out and voted and, and kind of just like did the opposite of my parents to kind of actually paying attention and then, you know, becoming a libertarian and all that stuff. And like my whole journey started by looking back at history and I became fascinated with certain figures that I was never taught about in school. And one of those people happened to be Silas Still- Stillman. Soul. So when I saw that you were doing an episode of that, like I was so excited <laughs> because That's nobody amazing. knows this man. Yeah, and he was amazing. Oh yeah, absolutely. He, I mean, that there's there's been some stuff done on him lately. Now there was a couple of kind of like okay, I guess, documentaries attempted to be done on him and stuff like that. Uh, you know, stuff on the Sand Creek Massacre too, but that was centering around him. But he was a fascinating character because I mean, you know, he his parents were abolitionists. You know, they were uh he was I, I think he was actually one of the Jayhawk one of the Kansas Jayhawkers, right? One of the original ones. Um he was going to try to break John Brown out of jail. And it's just that when John Brown said forget it. Don't worry about it. I don't want to be broken. Then that's when he let it go. But otherwise, that the plan was in place for him to try to break him out. So yeah, I mean, he was involved in a lot of things in the little time he was around. Yeah, unfortunately, he was killed in his thirties, and you know, you, you you covered that in the, in that episode where you know after everything he went through, after standing up to after standing up to his uh, you know his commanding officers. Which is something that rarely, you know, you don't hear that that happening that often throughout history in in American history. At least they don't they don't teach it that way in the schools. Yep. You don't you don't hear about it that much. Um, but this guy like went all out and stand, stood up against a whole bunch of people only to get you know pretty you know it, it's it's kind of I, I don't think I guess it was never really officially proven right who actually killed him or at least nobody was ever charged for it. Uh, no, I mean. Oh, they know who killed him. It's just that they ran off and they didn't exactly spend too much time looking for them. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, an actual hero that comes out, you know, you know, there's plenty of people that are glorified throughout history. And, you know, like I said, that that was my path. A lot, a lot of my friends, uh, Danilo included, uh, came to where he is currently in his philosophy and his, his views on life through the study of economics. For me, it was history because I just became fascinated and I was... Uh, specifically fascinated with uh, with American history, obviously, you know where I where I come from and and kind of where I was where I was viewing the world directly from at least. Right. So, so when I came, you know, and there's all these heroes that get thrown up through the, you know, through school, you know, when I went to elementary school and then in high school and then even even in my uh, different runs through college and the history course I take, there's all these people that are labeled as heroes and they're the ones that most people are told to to focus on and they're the ones who did all these great things and some of them did some of them also did some really really horrible things and are still labeled as heroes yeah, but, sure. but but people like silas soul unfortunately like i said nobody i mean you mentioned john brown most people well I, I shouldn't even say most a lot of people i i run across never knew about him either although if they do know any of the what was i guess ra- labeled the, the the more radical abolitionists of the day uh, you know back in the 1840s 50s 60s they uh he's the one person they do know but of course he was labeled a traitor and a ter- basically a terrorist <laughs> sure. and uh they were everybody's supposed to cheer the fact that he was caught and 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 eventually killed yeah i mean that right there tells you something about the civil war because you know when uh when John Brown was executed, that was seen as, yeah, he got what he deserved in the South, and he was getting, like, heroes parades in the North. And so we're like, whoa, that's a really divided country right there. Yeah, extremely. But even, you know, even though he was lauded in in the North... You know, the, the history books, at least the ones they, they were given out in school in, in my day back in like the 80s and stuff, uh, if, if there was any mention of him, there was there, like I said, there's brief mentions of maybe John Brown, but he's still, they, they still kind of uh, turned him into, into a villain anyway. Like right. that's, that's, the, that's the predominant story that gets pushed out about him is that he, you know, that, that he, you know, he may have had some good ideas about wanting to end slavery, but he, he, oh, he all, you know, went about it horribly the wrong way. <laughs> and well, uh, he got so, what he was deserved. You know, if somebody argues that, which is fine, you know, it's like you can make an argument saying, hey, the methods were wrong, fine. But if the methods were wrong, then the civil war was wrong. 
because you know if you're saying that the use of violence for the sake of eliminating slavery was wrong which you can definitely make that argument but if that's how you're gonna go then you should also argue that the civil war was wrong or if you argue that the civil war was okay then you should argue that also john brown was okay yeah that's that's a good point although that, that puts me in an interesting position because i agree mostly with john brown's methods i mean he did he he didn't always take innocent people into consideration when he was doing things but uh i do think the civil war was wrong and i i think actually i mean history seems to play that out because it does seem at least around that time that the u.s was the only place that actually had to go to those lengths to have slavery ended it, yeah. ev everywhere else around the world, they managed to end it through legislation of all things, <laughs> right. which usually doesn't work out. Well, and in fact, I think is um, yeah, there's something really weird about American culture in the sense that it really is different from anywhere else on pretty much every other topic. You know, from like I mean, if you look at like for example, you know, most Western. Let's stick to Western culture for simplicity's sake. If you look at Western cultures there's nowhere where the degree of uh, intense religious fundamentalism is as powerful as in the US. Uh, there's, uh, you know, there are several different things that are very unique to American culture that are, that you don't really see a whole lot around in many other places. Yeah, that, that does seem to be the case. I mean, at least in my, in my limited experience, I, I, I haven't traveled far. I try to keep up with what goes on, but it does seem that way, yeah. And yeah. it, it is interesting because I, again, I mean, I, I'm somebody who has studied a lot of this and, and changed a lot of my views because of it. But I, I look around and plenty of people I know and, you know, people I've grown up with and people in my life. And just there's still this this uh, kind of aura around it that, that people, I, I really, I'm, unfortunately, I think a lot of people, and these are, you know, like I said, people that are close to me too, and sometimes I feel bad about saying it. Other times I don't so much anymore because I give up at this point, but that they kind of live in this bubble that it's, you know, all these things that happen in American history or that the America is, uh, you know, the, 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 Ameri the idea of American exceptionalism. Sure. And, you know, and I don't know, I because I, I look at it from uh, from an outsider's eyes now because I've made friends all over the world, and I start looking at it and go, yeah, people think I can understand why there's this there's this uh, kind of attitude and this perception of the crazy, arrogant American, um, you know, because uh, at the same time, and that's you know part of that is true, and part of it there's also the opposite, right? There's so many. There are also a lot of amazing things that have come out of the United States that really don't come out from. So it's kind of a weird mix, you know. It's it's very easy to try to paint it in very black and white brush strokes, where it's either like U.S. Uh, everything associated with U.S. is horrible or evil, or you know, land of the, you know, home of the brave, land of the free kind of thing. There's usually those are the two narratives, either very very positive to the point of ignoring a lot of history or very negative also to the point of ignore it, to me it's like it's complicated you know it's uh and not just american history it's like most things i think human beings are comfortable for some reason with these oversimplifying things enjoying a very black and white narrative with clearly identifiable heroes and clearly identifiable villains and sometimes it's a little messier than that Oh, for sure. And, you know, you can tell you can tell that by list. I mean, just if you actually study, you know, history and, and look at these things and, you know, like you said, it doesn't doesn't really matter where P pick a period, pick, a, you know, pick a time period, pick pick some figures and you look at it. And as you go into in, in, in depth in a lot of your episodes, you know, when you're covering, you know, say one figure in particular, you can see that, that, you know, each individual has these like complicated things. And even these people who are lauded as heroes. Yeah. Some of th sometimes they did some really bad things, but that doesn't take away from the, from the amazing things that they did accomplish too. You're right. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, and most people do It's I think it is, a, it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, people look at it like that. And I, I had to break myself out of that habit. And I don't know, I, I think that comes from kind of the way 
most people, at least around here, <laughs> people are kind of taught that way. It's kind of, it's, that's kind of, con- you're kind of conditioned to like, look at it. It's like, oh, just, you know, let's not worry about that bad stuff. <laughs> like these are, these are the heroes. They're the good ones. You know, bad people are bad people. No, let's not look at their good deeds. If you, you know, if you look at their good deeds, you're simp- you're sympathizing with them. It's like, well, no, <laughs> not everybody's cut and dry. <laughs> I think it's just uh, the way human beings work. You know, we like that kind of simple tale because life is messy enough already. And anything that forces us to think too hard, we don't like it so much. So it's a lot nicer if we can blame all the problems on one set of people. We can assume that this other set of people are perfect and wonderful. You know, it's it makes things, at least in theory, easier. Now, in reality, of course, it doesn't because you're completely missing the point of what's going on in reality but it gives you the illusion of clarity. Yeah, I think that's true. And, uh, and it, and it's, it, 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 it creates this comfort level and, and definitely, I mean, I know as a, as a member of the human species, I, I do enjoy my comfort. So I can understand that you get, you know, you get very comfortable with something and okay. Yeah. That we'll, we'll accept that. And yeah, it does make it easier because have, having to look at, having to look at the complexity of these people really, I don't know, at least for me, and I can imagine for a lot of people as well that if you actually have to start digging into, you know, especially somebody who has been, you know, taught basically, you know, pick pick any figure again, who's been taught through your life to be like a hero and you're supposed to look up to and, and have yeah. respect for. And if you actually go digging in and you find that. Sure, they have this dark side, just like just about everybody, you know. And not everybody, not not nobody's perfect, and and uh, you know everybody has their skeletons and stuff like that. And if you go digging, it, it, you kind of if you, to, if you're going to be intellectually intellectually honest, at least I, I believe you have to kind of do some soul searching of your own there, because you have to kind of examine these things and really weigh them against the other factors that cause you to believe them to be a hero in the first place or vice versa. Somebody who's, who's, who you've been taught uh, or just it has, you've accepted at just on its face because you've been told this is a villain. You know, you see this throughout history too, with the pe- people who have been demonized, who, if you look into the stories, well, wait a minute, <laughs> maybe right. they actually had some reasons for what they were doing. <laughs> Yeah, 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 you're right. That's the way it is. Yeah, it's crazy. But uh but yeah, so I I mean like I was saying it before, I mean the the whole history game, I mean it it fascinates me and that's why I was so excited when I I found uh, I found out about you originally. Uh, I think it was it, it must have been a it, it was one of the Rogan podcasts I heard you on and I think uh coincidentally it happened to be somewhere around the time you were first starting the podcast because I, I can't remember now because it's it's been almost I guess almost three years now at this point you started it back in 2015 that I either managed to listen to the very first one or you were on shortly after so I had to go back and listen to the first couple but I haven't missed one since. Awesome, and, thank uh, you. So much. I, I I find because like I said that it's been it's been a big part of my journey and I originally like I found Dan Carlin at, at first and then I, I I've heard you talk about him as well and I've heard the two of you talk together and I know he he was an influence on you because there aren't a lot of at least entertaining as well as educational history podcasts out there. I mean, I'm very lucky, I think. I, I, I found three of them that I get to listen to now because I found found Dan Carlin's, and unfortunately, you know, his are so gosh darn long and so full of information that he can only put two out a year at this point. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and then, and then there's yours. And then another person who I've actually had the, uh, the opportunity to meet and hang out with a couple of times, which is great is, uh, I think, you, I, I believe you know him, uh, Prof CJ from the dangerous history podcast. It's great. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, so for me, it's, it, it's, I think it's it's so amazing to be able to listen to people, you know, like like you guys who can weave a great story. And when I first found out about you, I, I know there was a bunch of times you you mentioned early on your accent uh, in your podcast. You would say, you know, some people say it may be difficult to understand me, and you know, it's kind of like this, you know, you, it can get it can turn some people off. But I was just like fascinated right away because the first time I heard you on Rogan, you were because you were entertain, you know, not you you're this history professor guy, and mm-hmm. most people think, oh, that's got to be some stodgy old person you know glasses just like hangs out in a, hangs out in the library or maybe a cafe and writes stuff down you know it doesn't do anything 
Um, right. But you, are, of course, are much more than that because you're also you're also a martial artist. Uh, you uh, you 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 dabble in what is it uh, with Taoism and stuff like that. Uh, yep. You're you're into a whole bunch of different stuff. And uh, I just thought you were such a fascinating guy, and I, and I love listening to your show because it, it really. Not only do I even you know learn something, like I said, even with the Sand Creek Massacre one, which I knew, I thought just about everything I, there was to know about it because I've studied it inside and out. Listening to somebody like you who not only gives you the information, but weaves a very informative but entertaining story is so refreshing because you know before you guys before people like you came around it was always just like if you wanted to listen to a history podcast it was basically like you know listening to charlie brown's teacher maybe go wah 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 why not just drone on and on or uh uh ben still uh, not ben stiller uh ben uh what's his name who played uh, in, in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, the uh, the teacher, you know, Bueller, 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 uh, that, that type of monotone voice. Not very right. uh, pleasant to listen to. Yeah, and that's the that's the problem sometimes that, uh, you know, many, like especially in school, many people feel like history is boring. And, you know, it is. The way it is taught, it is boring. But it doesn't have to be. It's really a lot about how it's done. And that makes a, makes a huge difference, you know, because it's... Uh, if you can, to me, it's like good history should feel like the same way as people are excited when they are watching Game of Thrones. Good history is Game of Thrones. I mean, there really is no difference in some way. It's just, uh, it's just how you talk about it. You know, that really is where it's at. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and especially if you, you know, if you, if you have to have a good storyteller. And yeah, I mean, I remember again, back in school, his, I always did well in history, but it was basically just mem- you. Know, all you had to do was memorize certain things, yep. and you could ace. Uh, you know, you could ace all the tests. You could do well. Woohoo! I know my history. <laughs> but looking, you know, looking back when I started trying to re- when I tried to start digging in deeper, and I was like, I kept coming across all this stuff. Oh, I didn't know these. Uh, I never heard about this. It was. I, I thought back to it, and it was like, yeah. Even if I had heard some of these things, I probably would have zoned out because it was presented in such this in such a boring fashion. But Absolutely. but yeah, the the Game of Thrones reference I've heard you make that one before too, and it's 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 true because that's something. Uh, admittedly, I've I've still never watched the the TV show, but I have read all the books, and I was a big right. fan. I was a big fan of them. But yeah, you could totally see that by listening to listening to the way like you explain these stories. Like some of my some of my favorite ones that you do because, like I said, I've I've listened to every one of them, and I, I thought they were all great. Uh, but like some of the ones like the the crate the, the 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 crazy horse, uh, you know, that was like a oh, four yeah. part one. I think right, yeah, uh, well, you know, just the uh, the way you were the way that you were able to explain everything, and uh, again, you're you're so honest about the content you're providing. Because like, another thing you'll hear if you do catch other lectures or stuff like that, people present in not only this dry fashion, but it's just like they give you the information, and you're just kind of supposed to accept it as truth. And, you know, this is, this is the facts. This is, this is what happened. This is, you know, th- that's how it's presented. Whereas at least you, and I mean, I've never sat down in one of your classes. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, would, I, would, I would guess you would kind of be, do something along the same lines, but you let people know, like, there's a very limited amount of knowledge about certain things that you're talking about. Like the other, you know, the, the other one was the, uh, the Mexican conquest, um, sure. you know, that another, uh, multi-part series that you did, you know, there's plenty of things that we, nobody knows. <laughs> It was either written down, it was either never written down or it was written down and destroyed. And you're basically going on, you know, hundreds or sometimes in these some situations, thousands of years of hearsay. But Absolutely. And in some cases, the evidence we have is so thin that you have to kind of present, hey, this is what some people argue, this is what other people argue. Take your pick because, you know, the evidence is thin. Yeah, I, but that, like I said, that's why I appreciate uh, your style because you, you know, lay, lay all this out every, and it's not like you just laid it out once in the beginning and just accept people expect people to remember that. But you, you know, you as you're talking about these stories and stuff, you say, hey, you know, you'll you'll if you're going to delve into your 
you know, what you, what you, what you suspect may have happened, you'll let people know that <laughs> this, this is just your own interpretation, what you think might've happened or, or what may be the general consensus. But yeah, it's like I said, I, I think it's, it's a great service that you are, are providing. And, uh, I, I, for one, I appreciate it greatly. And, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you keep putting them out because like I said, there's, there's been things even with the, the most late, the most, most recent one, I thought I knew everything about and I still learn something. <laughs> right. No, I mean, that's what's tricky is like, I mean, the same thing happened to me. There are some topics where I feel like, come on, I know this stuff. Um, and once I start digging in and I start really researching it heavy, I realize, whoa, I don't know one tenth of what I thought I knew about it. It's a lot more complicated than I imagined. And my own understanding of a topic, once I tackle it in a history on fire episode, usually increases dramatically because that's when I realized, okay, I kind of had a good outline of the story, but man, there are so many more details that I ignored that, that are really interesting. Yeah. And it, you know, and, and again, that, that helps the, 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 those details are things, especially when you, you can weave those into these different types of stories that, that really bring a lot of these people or stories in general, just really to life. Because again, you're going on, if, if you're going out what you learned in history class or what you read out of a book, it's not necessarily the same. I mean, some people can, you know, have, have vivid imaginations and may be able to apply those vivid imaginations to very dry texts and you might be able to get something. But yeah, it re- it, it helps to be able to, um, whatchamacallit, like I said, kind of kind of weave that all together. And, you know, like I said, for me, I, I think it definitely helps me, uh, encourages me to continue learning because it's because when I can come across these stories that I think I've not only studied once or twice, like a lot of people, but really studied and then go, oh, crap. <laughs> you yeah, know. It's, and that's one of the problems with uh, producing this kind of podcast sometimes that you feel like you're never you never feel that you are done researching. You feel like, oh, come on, I could read three more books on this topic. You would add some understanding to this. But the reality is that there's a point where it's like, okay, it's diminishing return. You know, the amount of time you're putting for how much of a deeper understanding you're getting eventually start getting very little. But it's always a tricky, which I think is one of the reasons why people like Dan Carlin now are releasing like two episodes a year because... Dan is a guy who's very wrapped into, I want to make sure I really know my stuff from beginning to end. But that can become a really vicious game where you just never get out. It's like, okay, I, I'm not quite qualified yet. Let me dig a little deeper. Oh, in this one 400-page book, I found this half a page of stuff I didn't know. And so I need to read the next 400-page book. And it's like, you know, after a while, like, okay, you, got to, you got to call it and just say, okay, I'll, I'll go with the material I have now. Yeah, and uh, I mean, uh, obviously, I, I could see that I could see that happening. I mean, if I ever got involved in that, I have I have I have bouts with OCD, so I could imagine getting stuck and not wanting to uh, not wanting to do it till it's perfect. But you're right. There's there there is just there's a limited amount of time the human per- the human being has on this planet. So you you do have to pick your battles, uh, you know, from time to time. But again, as long as you put those disclaimers out there that this is, you know, the, where where you got the information, this is as far as you got with the information, you know, then other people, if they want to take that particular topic and keep going, you know, that's on them <laughs> yeah. and uh, they're free to do so. But uh, what, what, what I was going to ask, because uh, I did mention it before now, are you still actively teaching like in university currently? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think I, I think I've heard you talk about this before, but mm-hmm. like, what do you, like you're? I mean, do you see the 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 current model lasting much longer because of the availability of all this stuff online, and because people like you have started branching out in different fields, even from a podcasting topic uh, subject, but then jumping even further to somebody say like you know Thaddeus Russell, who's trying to get on get the whole uh you know renegade university up and running and stuff like that uh yeah. w- you know where where do you where do you see that going and what are you uh what are you planning to do with that with that ch- change if you see if you see one coming i mean start with the fact that the majority of people are in college are not in college because they want to be in college they're in college because they have to be in college because they feel that they need that they need their piece of paper in order to get the job or whatever else so you know as long as colleges have uh, somewhat of a monopoly over that it's closed. You know, there's not really much of, uh, you know, the number of people who go to college purely for personal enrichment 
those are the people who probably would find other ways to go about it and they wouldn't need to go because there are other resources that become available with internet and so on. But that's a really, really, really small minority of the people who go to college. Hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I guess. I mean, it's been, it's been a while for me. I mean, I, I was back in college well over a decade ago. I never, never actually made it out either. But I, I, I guess, I, I don't know. I'm one of those people that wishes the the, the structure would uh you know the, or at least the system would either change greatly or just collapse because i think i think it's gotten c- completely out of hand but i think uh because i think most people like you said are are, are go- going there because they think they have to not necessarily because they do have to because unfortunately these days most of the people that go their degree is just wasted anyway right <laughs> they don't you know only only specific fields actually need them and everything else is either all filled up or people are getting degrees that actually don't go anywhere and, and i think that partially is definitely the case you know where you do get uh, the fact that it's probably a good idea to really think about whether you need it or not because especially the price of college tuition has been going up a lot. So then the obvious question is, you know, is it worth it? Is it still something that you need to? That is one issue. The other issue regarding college that is also a little tricky to substitute is the, um, is the social aspect. That I think it was... Um, like part of the part of the problem is that you can get the education, you can get the knowledge in other ways. Uh, it's kind of hard to get the experience of the hanging out with people your age uh, for four years or five years in a row, whatever that is. Doesn't, there are not too many other places where that happens. And one of the problems of American society as it's currently structured is that it's already a monstrously lonely society where people have very few occasions to meet one another. So, you know, if you ask me, for example, about my college experience, I think that in terms of learning my college experience, I could have gotten the same done in 10% of the time on my own. So in that sense, I felt like I wasted a hell of a lot of time. Um, The part that's hard to make up for is the social one, which is the same kind of thing why, for example, is a little tricky for people who do homeschooling. It's like, you know, you can have some things where you can try to make up for it, but there are many others where it's not that easy. And I think that's one of the problems that we're still facing in terms of how do we, if we want to get rid of, you know, the traditional college learning and all of that stuff, how do you substitute the social experience? Because, you know, when you look at one of the number one diseases for people that are affecting anything from depression to health to everything else is that, you know, we live in a relatively, I mean, as far as history goes, one of the most affluent societies there ever been. And yet most people are miserable as hell. Half of the country is on antidepressant. And, you know, they're clearly something off. And one of the huge elements in this is loneliness and alienation from other human beings. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. Uh, great point, actually. And I think, I think, I think you're right. And I, I mean, I, I hadn't really considered that, I guess, aspect at least, cause I, I focus a lot on the, the, the current structure with the, uh, you know, the, the, the lower level skirt, like the secondary schooling and stuff like that. And, uh, elementary schooling, all that, where the kind of forced socialization aspect, I think actually backfires and maybe maybe it's done too long, but I guess I, I, I can see the, the opportunity to have, uh, that socialization for that, you know, that, that amount of time at that age, uh, probably could. I mean, again, it does backfire for a lot of people. It does seem right, at least in the, at least in the U S but, uh, overall, like I, I, like I said, I hadn't really considered that. I, I guess that, uh, that probably is an important component. Uh, although I, I think, maybe a lot of the loneliness factor, like I said, actually is kind of built from the, when they, before they get to college, the, the, the system they go through, the schooling system they go through here first. I don't know. I, I, I've, I always felt alienated through that system and I know I've met plenty of other people along the way who did too. Uh, it, it seems to kind of breed that, you know, it is, it's far from good as is, and it's even weird. It's one of the things where it's kind of like you're damn if you do and damn if you don't. In the sense that, you know, if you look at 
does that really deliver this amazing social experience? Not really. But without it, in many cases, it's even worse. So it's one of the things where it's like, yeah, this is not a good setup, for sure. Um, the alternatives are usually not much better either, or in many cases, even worse. So it's one of the things where it's like, okay, how do we, how do we get around it? What can we do? Because those are, I mean, that's one of the big, big issues when it comes to um, when it comes to American life is figuring out how to deliver that experience. You know, I can stay in my room with internet and a library card and probably have the ability to learn stuff that I could learn in college, but at a much faster rate. But still, that doesn't solve the, the social aspect of it all. And that's where I'm like, okay, yeah, I don't really, like even like forget even college, like the people after college, where do most people meet one another? How do most people hang out? You know, it's one of the things where it's very tricky because the reality of the situation is that, you know, you most people get a job with 20 cubicles and there are 19 other people. And so you're going to pick the least annoying person there to be your work friend. But, you know, that's not really saying much. And, you know, which is why people are kind of glued in front of TV all day long. And, um, because they lack that human contact to a large degree. Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny you, you mentioned that because I actually, I saw, you know, you, you were asking where do people meet each, you know, and it's, that's, that's it. A lot of people either have, you know, they have, they meet people through work or some people manage to retain friends they had, you know, through, through high school or college or stuff like that. But, you know, as most people know, as you get older, stuff like, you know, those relationships become strained because people live far apart from each other and hard to do that stuff. And having people in uh, close proximity that you can actually physically see, because it's great to be able to connect with people and talk to people. You know, I have friends that live all across the country. I talk to them almost daily through different, ser you know, whether it's on the phone or different uh, messaging services or, you know, chat chatting back and forth, but it's, it's not the same. And Absolutely. Yeah, but the the when you said that, I, I I was I was thinking about a meme I saw earlier, which said because other the other than well, other than work, uh, most people think you know where do you meet people? Oh, you end up you know most people go to hang out for like relationship type stuff, you know, um, and then it ends up bleeding over and like meeting new friends that way too is like in bars or situations like that. And there was a meme I saw earlier today is like how much different would the world be if say like you know bookstores and different other creative more more creative type places were open a heck of a lot later and people hung out there and it became friends or, or tried to form relationships whether right. whether romantic or otherwise you know in the time you're allowed because a lot of people work the standard nine to five job and if they have other if they have kids and they have other responsibilities and stuff you know what time do they have sure later at night that's when you finally have some time alone to yourself to go do something and if you have kids and you have the luxury to be able to go you know get somebody to watch them and go out or you don't have kids and you can go out yeah it's later at night how, how much different would the world be i i don't know i would, would that be better <laughs> right no exactly and it's um in fact it's one of the things where it's like our current system our current way of life is in dire need of a revamping in so many areas and the reality is that we don't really necessarily have the answer. It's not just a matter of saying, oh, you know, some evil government is holding us back. I mean, that stuff exists as well. But there's also the other problem of just, we don't know, you know, because nobody has tried some of these things in generations. So who knows? Actually, nobody has tried it at all in this context, because it's a completely new context compared to what people were facing decades ago. So we don't really know how to, it's obvious that we have a problem, you know, it's obvious when you look at the rates of suicide, antidepressant use, all of that, it's obvious that something here is not very healthy, but it's not obvious what to do about it and how we go about, because it's not just one thing, it's about really just a way of life, restructuring the whole thing from your relationship with food to your relationship with other human beings to your, you know, in so many different areas of life education, you know, you name it. And, uh, and it really is a matter of like, okay, we need to redesign life in society and we don't have a whole lot of guidelines for what that means, for what's a healthy answer and what isn't, you know? Sure. 
And I, I, well, I think a, a big part of that is uh, that because there, you know, the, the, the reality is there, there isn't any one answer and there can't be, uh, of course. because, you know, just, just because of all, you know, well, even just because all the reasons you just listed, you know, about all these different things that the individual has to kind of reconnect with, or, you know, in, in order to overcome this, uh, like you were saying with the, with the, the stuff with the food and all these different things. And it's, it's so different. I, I mean, yeah, there's, there's, there's general things that kind of overlap between most people and stuff like that. And then of course there's outliers after the, on, on, on all those too, but you know, on, for the, for the most part, you know, even take education, you know, that like you were saying before, that's, that's what's the system is what it's now and it's broken, but you know, what are the alternatives? Well, exactly. I, I think the, the only way to really find out is to try to p- present as many alternatives as possible, you know, that's- uh, I, yep. I'm, I'm a big fan of decentralizing pretty much as ever, as many things as you possibly can and getting as many options. And, you know, you, cause you mentioned the, the, you know, the quote unquote, like the evils of government before. Sure. And sure that you're, you know, I, and I'd probably lean more towards that than, than you would. Um, but even, even still like, yeah, you're right. That does exist, but there's other things going on too. And, you know, I, I, at least my understanding throughout looking throughout history and stuff for the most part, you know, people in governments do bad things, but overall culture is, is what drives politics and yep. therefore drives government, you know, it's, cu- it's downstream from culture. So it's still a reflection of a certain, to a certain extent of the people in, in that are in that area. <laughs> why in so many cases when, uh, you know, there's some kind of a revolution that really alters a system in plenty of cases, they, you know, it's like, okay, great. Now we got, we agreed that the previous system sucked and it was terrible and we got rid of it. Excellent. Now what? Because that, that's why you, in so many cases you see revolutions fail because everybody agrees perfectly on why a certain system sucks and is terrible and need to be replaced. But when it comes time to figure out what's a healthier alternative, then suddenly the consensus start breaking down and things get a lot messier. So that's where some of these things are, uh, are fascinating because, you know, it's like you need both. You know, you need to get rid of a bad system for sure. But also then you also need to figure out how to create a better system. And that's the, you know, if getting rid of a bad system is difficult, then creating a better system is even more difficult. So it's clearly some messy business right there. Oh, yeah, it's very messy. And I, I totally agree. I mean, that's why, you know, this kind of stuff that I talk about on this show and a lot of the other shows I do and, uh, and just a lot of the, I guess, activism I've done for years now uh, is is not just about, you know, oh, yeah, government's bad. We need to do something about it. It's like, OK, yeah, we you know, that that's how it started. But then, OK, sure. you need answers because most people will agree. You're right. will agree with you if you say something like that. It's like, yeah, they all suck. And then it's right. like the next thing is, well, what do you got for us? And if you're not prepared to answer that question, then most people will go, okay, then now, what? then, okay, whatever. We're just going to ignore you now. <laughs> and, right. you know, and with the, your point about revolution is very good too, because, you know, either they fail or they get taken over by the, the most, uh, you know, the one, the opportunist group involved that has the, you know, the, the, the quickness to, to jump on it. And those will all forget pointed out. I, at least in my understanding, looking back at the history and people say, Oh, look at these horrible people. They, they, they started this revolution and they're the ones who took it out and they're the ones who do it. It's like, no, they, they just took advantage of the fact that everybody did want a revolution. Like you said, everybody was like, yeah, we, we need something to be done. But when they got there, either every, they gave, every, either everybody gave up because nobody could come up with an answer or one group came into power. Cause they're like, well, we're just going to take advantage of the situation now. And that's why you end up with those revolutions where the next government that gets put in place is even more tyrannical than the one that was just disposed of because nobody knew what to do. So yep. I, I'm a big proponent of, of providing, ex, you know, examples and like kind of the whole leading by example thing is like trying to create things, which is difficult to do inside the systems of government because of all the regulations and stuff, but try to find ways to create things to show people, hey, this is what you could do. We could do it this way, you know? Absolutely. And I think that's more needed than ever. 
is that leading by example, for sure. Because otherwise, and don't get me wrong, I mean, there's a place to being able to call out what's sick about a certain system. It's very much needed. But then even more important is that aspect, is then leading by example of showing what could be a better system. Because it's kind of like, you know, it's like when you're trying to diet from some crappy food that you're addicted to, that you know it's bad for you, if all you do is think about how you shouldn't be eating that food, you're not going to be very successful. Because before you know it, even though you know everything that's wrong with it, you're still going to go back to it because you don't have a better alternative. The moment you actually get happy eating food that's healthier, then you don't. Th- then it's not even that hard work to try to get rid of the bad stuff because you're already happy, you're satisfied with the alternative. And I think that's where that's where the key is: is being able to create those uh, satisfactory alternatives. Yeah, that's a that's a great point because I, I as you were saying that I was thinking, oh yeah, like I, I often struggle with stuff when it comes to diet and like I know there's things I shouldn't eat, but a few years back I, I tried the whole paleo thing and I actually lasted quite a while on it and it was exact I because it was I did exactly that <laughs> I found all I I didn't think of it at the time but now looking back I'm like oh yeah that's exactly what I did I that time around I actually found alternatives really quickly and I was like oh I like this oh this is good oh yeah. I don't need that other junk anymore and you know I was. I was pretty hardcore about it for almost a year, <laughs> which these days it would seem impossible to me because I love right. th- I love things like my I love things like my ice cream just a little too much. Yeah, right. <laughs> of course. Um, but yeah, like I said, uh, I, I, yeah, I'm, I, I definitely uh, I, I think that the the leading by example thing is you know it's what I it's what I try to preach and you know we were talking about the whole education thing before and yeah where where do you go with that what do you tell people to do because there aren't what what options are there I mean uh, unfortunately at least here here in the states I mean there's private schools but they're under a lot of most of the same regulations that the, the public ones are so there's there may be a there may be a slight difference uh, and it may be you know the social order there may be a little bit different but overall it's it's not very much different um, and like you said you could if you do you know the homeschooling thing can go horribly wrong too because yeah if you're taking things uh, if you're taking kids and just sticking them in like you know in their in the kitchen and just with a pile of books and like you just read uh do this you know take this test learn this you know and then they're not getting any socialization whatsoever and you know like you said you you said earlier you could have done you could a lot of people could probably do that for college you know yep. cra- st- stick stick yourself in a room for like a month or two and learn much of what you would learn in a four, in a four year degree's worth, uh, but you know what have what have you lost otherwise? You know you may have that opportunity to do it afterwards, but you may not. You know, and you may not be. You know, you may miss out on being with other people. So uh, that's why I mean, like me personally, I I, I have uh, I have uh, six and a half year old t- uh, twin daughters, and we unschool them. And I'm a big proponent of that idea, but I also don't tell, I also don't go around telling everybody that this is the answer and everybody needs to be doing this <laughs> because it doesn't work for everybody and it doesn't work for, you know, it, do, it doesn't work. It doesn't even work for everybody who tries this, <laughs> uh, you know, but there's, there's, there's opportunities out there. Um, kind of on the same, on the same level as you were talking about with the colleges and being able to like learn all that information in a very short amount of time. Uh, you know, that's kind of the idea with the whole unschooling models. You can actually, you know, learn these things, uh, you know, the 15,000 hours, I think it is that they, that you go through, through the, uh, K through 12 system, uh, could actually be cut down to like 200, I think is, is the figure that I hear a lot, uh, especially from people like Brett Vinod over the school sub sucks, pro, uh, podcast and you know you can really learn all the basics in that time now if you can get all that stuff out of the way then you do have the opportunity to do but like you said a lot of people don't a lot of people if they do the homeschooling route they're not taking as much advantage as they can of getting the kids out there to be able to socialize and get involved in all these things and you know that's why i i I, like my friend danilo uh danilo uh who i actually just uh, talked to 
a couple of uh, a couple of days before uh, he tried to hook the two of us up here. He uh, and it, it that's why I'm uh, such a big fan of the way he does things with his kids because he's out there all the time. Like he's a stay at home dad, and right. he does the unschooling thing with them. But he's out all the time. Like they're involved in as many different groups as they can find and different sure. classes. And it's what all you know what the kids are interested in. He's not forcing them into anything. They they're yeah. they're choosing what they want to learn. But they're actually going out there doing it. And you know there's plenty of these things that a lot of people don't realize you could actually get done for free even still or that are still very low cost a lot of people say oh if i have to pay for all these classes i can't do it well no you can <laughs> you just gotta look um yeah. but if you're out there doing it you, then the kids still get all that socialization aspect uh and they get to choose what they want to learn you know i personally think it's a great model but i don't think it'll work for everybody i think there's definitely kids who need more structure you know yeah. Um, is it uh, for him is it kind of a full-time job uh pretty much yeah like he does part-time work still uh he's because he's an acupuncturist too <laughs> uh, so right. i think he does that part-time and uh he produces uh content too he does one you know his podcast and a bunch of other stuff but yeah it's a, it's it's basically a full-time job during the day while his, his wife's out at work uh which i'm actually tr trying to get into myself uh we were talking a little bit before we started recording about you know the fact that i'm trying to move out of here and uh, start my bison ranch. <laughs> and uh, when we move, the plan is actually for my wife. Well, I, I call her my wife. We were never legally married. But anyway, we were. Uh, she's going to go back to work, and I was going to stay home and kind of do the the Nilo thing uh, with my right. kids, and yep. hopefully get them out there to do that. But yeah, I I recognize the fact that it is a full time job. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's you know that's uh, sometimes the other problem that you need to also feel like in order to like okay, let's say we figure that out right that part is great wonderful then there's the part of how do you get to be able to do it which again that's another huge stumbling block for a lot of people where they can figure out the economics of being able to find a way so that only one parent work a lot the other one can you know it's so it's kind of like that's what it's tricky about it is that there are many many different issues that are all tied to one another you know it's not just one thing or another it's a bunch of different things that okay so let's say we do find out all the activities for the kids and all the things where they can have plenty of socialization and they learn at home and you know that's awesome okay how do we afford it okay that opens a whole other kind of world yep. none of, the, all of these things are impossible they are possible they are just you know talk about having to work for your freedom right that's some serious, serious stuff that like 99% of people are not going to be able to pull off. Oh yeah, no, I, I, I'm very, I'm very aware of that. <laughs> and uh, you're right, though, it is, and it, it's daunting. Yep. And, and and like I was saying before, I used to make arguments against that and be like, oh well, you know, there are like you said, there are ways for it to be done. And yep. I used, to, you know, when I first got into this, I was very militant about it, unfortunately. And I look back on that and kind of cringe at my at a lot of my words back then because <laughs> I was like, oh, anybody could do this. And and the reality is, you're right. It's it's not as easy for everybody. And there's circum everybody has different circumstances. But like I said, that's why my big thing is just I I, I try to promote choice. <laughs> that's that's I'm, I'm pro-choice in pretty much everything it's just like let you know give people as many options as you possibly can i mean as as far as is the you know wherever you are the current government you have to deal with you know if it's if it's going to be there because well they've been there for quite a while and they're probably going to be there for quite a quite a quite a, a while longer uh you know at the very least try to get things so it's you have as many options available under the under the choices you know under what they the structure they give you because that's the real that's really the only way it things I, I think can possibly get better because right. you know if e even if they even if they were to scrap the entire system and and bring in a new one well that's just bringing in a new you know one more one size fits all system haven't we learned yet that that never goes well yeah exactly that one doesn't quite work out so well yeah definitely yeah so um but anyway, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know how much time you have. I don't. I want to take up too much of your time. Uh, I know. Uh, I, I know we kind of did this last minute. Um, but uh, before before we uh, get closing out, I guess. Um, first of all, like I said, uh, I really appreciate you coming on. This is, this has been great, and uh, I, 
I really appreciate you giving me the time. Uh, you know, I, I hate to sound like I'm such a fanboy, but <laughs> you know, no, you, you, you show really, you show really does uh, a, a lot for me. You know, like I said, I, I keep learning things, and I, I mentioned some of them earlier. Uh, the one thing, I, the one thing I, I did want to uh, kind of ask though, um, is because you've obviously been in the history game now overall for quite a, for a while, and uh-huh. uh, you know. How is how has that shaped your views? Like, have they? Do they? Do your views overall, just in general, like on on the world or maybe politically, whatever, continue to evolve to evolve because of this? Or were you like, have you have you gone to places that you just weren't expecting because of what you learned over the years? I mean, certainly, the more the more I add the pieces to the puzzle, the greater the understanding, for sure. Um, there are certain things. I mean, the beauty, the beautiful thing about history is that there are really few things that can teach you as much about human nature. You know, you have this lab of ideas that have been tested throughout history and how they have worked out for some people, how they worked out for other people. So, you know, studying history to me is really like studying about human nature at the end of the day. You learn so much about the way human nature works as a result of it. So... Yeah, I do find it incredibly useful, and I do feel that I've learned a lot thanks to it. Oh well, yeah, I can imagine. I mean, like I said, I, I've only da- I've only dabbled in this stuff, and I, I find it fascinating. And uh, I'm glad there's people out out there like you that are uh, that have dug into it even deeper. And uh, I can le- I can learn from you uh, because uh, you know, like I said earlier, you, you definitely not only uh, pack a lot of information to these episodes, but you definitely uh, make them entertaining as well. And uh, you, because uh, I mean, the the stuff I have to read many times is not entertaining. But then once I dig, uh, you know, the whole goal is to dig for these little nuggets of gold in between some really boring stuff. But then once I'm done with it, I can usually then put together a narrative that's more interesting and more entertaining and still accurate. But, you know, adding, uh, um, weaving together all the accurate information that in order to get, you have to go through a lot of sometimes pretty boring stuff but then put it together in a fashion that hopefully is more entertaining. Yeah. Well, uh, like I said, for, from my perspective, you definitely continue to pull it off because, uh, you know, of, of all the, of all the ones, you know, like I said, there, I definitely have my favorites and obviously the most recent ones, which I'm, I'm, I'm patiently awaiting the uh, part three of that. Cause you said there was going to be another one added to that <laughs> after you guys did your individual ones. Um, but, uh, Two of the one and uh, two two of the ones that I found really fascinating that I didn't think I would uh, were actually the one on uh, Caravaggio. Is that I, I'm oh, probably yeah. pronouncing it horribly wrong? Um, yeah. Because at first I was like, I heard the name and I'm like, I've heard that somewhere before. And like, you know, I'm like, he's was, was like a painter guy or whatever. Like, oh my god, what am I going to care about this? Um, yeah. But that was a fascinating story. <laughs> Yeah, that story is one of my favorites. And yeah, you're right. You know, when you say this, it's like, eh, it's a painter. How fun can it be? Yeah. It's a great, wild story. To me, it's like, it's kind of like a story. It's sort of like Tupac, a Tupac being a painter in Italy as opposed to being a, a rapper in the United States. It's a crazy, wild tale where it involves, uh, you know, murder, duels, running away from the police, and... Uh, art and street life and i mean some crazy crazy things yeah it was it was it was like it, it, I, I could picture the movie that would be made out of that and yeah. <laughs> you know i mean hollywood of course wouldn't do any any justice but you know i was i was picturing it in my head because it, it was that it was that intense but it like i said it was it was that one and then on for completely different reasons uh was your series on teddy roosevelt because oh, yeah, yeah. that's one that uh, you know, as somebody who I you know, if I if I identify as anything, it's a it's a I guess an anarchist. But yeah. uh, you know, the uh, I you know kind of kind of kind of have issues with a lot of, with a lot of, a lot of historical government and political figures and stuff like that. And Roosevelt, I've not only gotten to know, like gotten to be, become to view as just like the imperialist that he was. Oh. You know, yep. um, and and focused on the bad things that he did, yep. but I also had the uh, the bias going in because I live on Long Island in New York, where right. they have Sagamore Hill, 
which yep. is you know is the is enshrined to Teddy Roosevelt. Right. And my grandmother used to drag me there as a child. And, yeah. you know, between the ages of eight and 10, I had no interest whatsoever of learning about Teddy Roosevelt at that time. So I had that bias go like I had, you know, a lot of biases going into it, but I still found myself riveted by it. And not just because of the how I normally stay riveted because of your style, you know, your style. It's you know very engaging, and you 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 don't you definitely don't give people the opportunity to be lulled to sleep at all. But uh, just some of the things you brought out, like at at first when you were the the way you were presenting it at certain times, like I was like kind of grumbling to myself, like oh he's like it's like this is hero worship, this is insane, this guy was such a bad guy. But like the more I listened, I was like I walked away from it going grumbling to myself again going all right maybe he's got a point <laughs> maybe maybe he really was that fascinating and there really were some really interesting like things about him like take away strip away some of the other po political stuff but the guy was definitely fascinating <laughs> yeah and i mean some of the disturbing stuff was disturbing you know there's no argument which is why it's funny because people are always again there's either the hero worship or the guy is the ultimate evil it's a bit of a mix, you know, it's kind of like there are some things that were absolutely awful about Roosevelt. There are other things that are really, really interesting. And so it's one of the things where it's like, okay, where does that leave us? You know, what uh, we so often would like it to be one way or another. And Roosevelt is one of those guys who very much defy categories that way. He's just a weird, fascinating guy who's both lovable in some way absolutely awful in other ways and it's you know it's that's what keeps it fun that's what keeps it pretty fun to chat about him yeah well like i said you definitely <laughs> you, you caught you caught my attention all the way through on that one because i i, I went in wanting to hate it so i went in i i went in going this is going to be the first one of these uh, these this podcast that i'm actually not going to like i know it i'm going to be so mad <laughs> Um, yeah. But, but yeah, yeah. You, you, got, you got me anyway. So uh, bravo, sir. Yeah. Sweet, sweet, sweet. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm having fun with it. You know, it's like these are all topics that I'm interested in. You know, there's nothing that I cover that I don't feel like covering. So that's the beauty of it is that I get to research things that I find fascinating and I find, uh, and, and so that makes up for a lot of the pain and boredom of having to go through monstrous 500 page monographs that sometimes are really not that fun uh, but the topics are interesting and so it's just a matter of finding um, the right way to approach them allow you know and, and i'm you know overall i'm really having a good time with the whole thing all right great well once again thank you so much for uh, for giving me some time tonight and before we get going please uh give uh, any plugs you would like to uh give out before we uh, close the show I guess, you know, if you guys want to probably just start with the podcast, if you guys want to check out History on Fire, that would be sweet. Um, then, you know, there are 10,000 other things I do, but, you know, start with History on Fire, see if you like it. And then if you do, I'm sure Google will be your friend and you can find some of the other things that I'm working on. Yes. Yeah, well, I'll I'll, I'll definitely th throw some of uh, some of the links in the uh, show. And like I said, I mean, I, I know you do because I mean, I know you do a completely other podcast too, which I still haven't yeah. gotten to at this point. But uh, I'm so between between your podcast, CJ's podcast, Carlin's when it comes out, and all the other podcasts I listen to, I, who who has the time? <laughs> but one well, maybe like I listen to podcasts primarily when I drive, you know, and uh, I do lots of driving, so I got to hear lots of podcasts. But yeah, that's. But I'm, or, you know, you work out or something, because if you have to sit down and listen to two hours of a podcast, that's rough, you know, who has that kind of time. Uh, I find it that it works while I'm doing something else anyway. You know, I'm working or I am whatever that may be, something that allows me to uh, do two things at once, then that makes it a lot easier to, um, to check out many podcasts. 
Yeah, well, I, I, I had I had an advantage for years. I, I ran my own pet sitting company, so I spent a good portion of my day walking dogs. So I had like six right. to ten hours of day <laughs> of listening to yeah, podcasts. That will allow you to listen to a lot of stuff. <laughs> yes, yes. But all right. So once again, thank you, uh, D- Daniele. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. This has been Abolitionist Abstractions. Uh, all of my content still can be found at solpodcast.org. Uh, anybody looking to donate uh, I did get a couple of requests about that uh, you can just go to the solpodcast.org through our Patreon over there because all that money gets filtered back to me eventually so <laughs> for people who are asking that's where you can go for that and once again thank you uh, we will catch you next time love, peace and voluntary interactions for all This is Daryl W. Perry, host of Free Talk Live. This November, I'll be running in the world's biggest and most popular marathon, the New York City Marathon. And I've accepted a spot on Team Innocence Project because I'm a passionate supporter of their work. Since 1989, 353 people in the United States have been exonerated by DNA testing, including 38 who pled guilty to crimes they did not commit and 20 of whom served time on death row. The Innocence Project provided direct representation or critical assistance in 180 of these cases. With your help, the Innocence Project can help even more people who have been wrongly convicted. As part of Team Innocence Project, I am raising awareness about wrongful convictions and raising funds to help free the innocent. I've already paid the race registration fees. However, to secure my spot on Team Innocence Project in the New York City Marathon, I need to raise $3,500 by November 1st. You can support the Innocence Project and help me secure my race entry by going to run.freetalklive.com.